Hi, and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. This is part five of a multi-part series on building an 80s style coin-operated retro arcade machine. If you haven't seen the previous parts of this series, you can find links down in the video description. But in part five, I'm going to talk primarily about the Ultimark iPad controller, wiring up the control panel, other internal cabinet wiring, including the master power control. And I'll cover a little bit about the audio video controls as well. So let's get started. So at the end of part four, the cabinet build itself was complete. It had been painted, T-molding had been installed, and it had been moved down to its final location in the basement. This is going to be all about wiring. I'm going to start with installing the arcade controls and wiring them up to the iPad controller. As I mentioned in part one of this series, all of my arcade controls came from a company called Ultimark, located in London, England. Now, one of the nice things about the Ultimark controls, they design it so that the joysticks and the trackball mount from underneath the control panel with no exposed screws. Unlike these lower cost controls that I used on my prototype, where the joysticks mounted from the top and leave these exposed screws. Now, that could cause a problem with either your hand being scraped by those, or like in my case, if you're going to apply vinyl and plexiglass, these exposed screws are going to be a problem. So the way the Ultimark approaches this is they provide these small inserts and you drill your hole for this insert on the underneath side of your board, insert that, and then you screw into these inserts from the underneath side. That way you have no exposed uh, screws on the top of your control panel. However, the issue that I had, at least for the joysticks, these inserts were really designed for three quarter inch thick wood, and I was only using a half inch. So all I ended up having to do is just cut a quarter inch piece of scrap wood in here, bore my hole in that, then I could put the insert in there and have the right depth for my joysticks. Now for the trackball, it was no problem. The inserts were actually small enough that they went directly into the half inch wood. There's one little other part of this I want to go ahead and mention, since it's the only thing on the control board that isn't Ultimark, I decided that I actually wanted some sort of indication of when those the joystick uh, servos were in motion. So I basically took a small little red LED and hooked that up and tested it to see if I could have the light turn on when the motors were in motion and go back off when they weren't. And what I found is this the, the servo control board here is really by going ahead and just sticking a LED and a resistor in there, I would be able to tell exactly when the servos were in motion. So if you watch right below the joysticks, you'll see the little red light come on and that indicates that the servo's in motion. It wasn't necessary, but I kind of wanted to know when the servos were turning. So at this point, both joysticks are mounted, the trackball is mounted, and my IPAC IO controller board is mounted here. You can also see again, the leads for those LED lights are there. Just another little quick side view to see that I actually put this on some mounting feet for the controller board just to get it up off of the surface. And here is all of the controls installed, but not yet wired. So again, all of the buttons are in place, uh, the joysticks and the servos. This is the spinner control. This little board here is actually the control board for the joystick servos. And again, the Ultimark uh, control board. So everything is going to be wired into this control board. The only thing coming off the control board to the Raspberry Pi will be two USB cables, one for the control board and one for the servo control. Each button is going to have a total of six wires coming from, from the button to the control board. Two for the actual switch itself that registers the button push. And then there are going to be four wires for the RGB light inside of the buttons. But before we get all the wires in place, let's take a little bit closer look at the controller board. So this is the Ultimark IPAC Ultimate IO Pro board. And it really makes hooking up all of your controls very easy. So I'll start right down here, and there's a little bit of glare on the board, so I'm sorry about that. But these first four pins are your joystick connections for up, down, left, or right for player one. An option for eight push buttons for player one. You'll see a player one and player two start button. A coin one and coin two door and then all of those are repeated again for the second player controls and then you actually have some auxiliary buttons a 1a and a 1b and a 2a and a 2b i'm going to use the 1a and the 1b for those pinball buttons that i installed on the side of the cabinet and then a single ground connection so all of these only have to have a single ground here what you'll see in a minute you'll see how the ground connection is actually daisy chained amongst all of the buttons in the controls 
Up here at the top is your connection for your trackball, connection for spinner, and optionally, uh, player three and player four controls. So joysticks and up to four buttons for player three and player four. I'm obviously not using those. You do have a couple of uh, 12 volt drivers up here, uh, up to one amp, that if you actually want to run 12 volt LED strip lighting, this board will support that as well. I believe it's a five volt power in, and again, a USB connection back to the Raspberry Pi. And finally, down the left and right hand side of the board are all of your LED connections. This will support up to 32 uh, RGB LEDs, so up to 32 lit controls on your control panel. And each one of them uses four pins, a power pin and then a pin for your red, your green, and your blue. Now, one thing to note, let me move my head out of the way here for just a second. On the other side of the board over here, notice that this is in reverse order. So over here, it's power, red, green, blue. Over here, it's blue, green, red, power. That is something important to note to make sure you don't get things hooked up backwards. Also, it doesn't really matter what uh, LEDs go to which control in any particular order, but that order will come into play when you start looking at RGB commanders. So uh, I'll show you the mistake I made and how you might learn from that when you go to hook up your own controls. And here is the jungle of wires when everything is hooked up. Cable management is key here, and I really didn't do all that good of a job. But just to take a quick look, I did say that each button is going to have five actually six wires uh, you can see a little bit the four wires here for the uh, led control and then if you take a look at, at the switches which are these black boxes again there are two wires there but notice that the ground wire the black is daisy chaining uh, from one control to the other so we don't have to run black wires all the way back we're just going to run a single ground connection back for all of the, uh, the button controllers uh, the little board on top of the trackball is the led controller for the light inside of the trackball itself and as i mentioned i did not worry about the order i was hooking up the rgb controls because i knew an rgb commander which i'm going to talk about in part six in more detail i'm going to map which button is connected to which uh, of the rgb pins on the controller board so what i tried to do was minimize my wire runs i actually did have to buy some extension cables for these harnesses because some of these links over here if I have one complaint about Altamark and maybe they've changed this since I bought it is that the wiring harnesses are relatively short if I could add my control board right in the middle where this trackball was I probably would not have had to have any extension cables but because of where I ended up having to put it I actually did have to use a number of extension cables for the controls on this side of the board and I'll just make a couple of other quick notes about the wiring runs you can see I actually drew a line where the control board is going to rest on the cabinet itself. So all of my wiring needed to be sure it was inside of these lines. Also, I had to be a little bit careful to make sure none of the wiring runs were going to interfere with this servo or get tangled up into this as that restrictor plate turned. But here it is all said and done, set back up on top of the cabinet. Uh, looked really good. Again, remember that plexiglass and the vinyl are really just being held in place uh, by the buttons and the controls themselves. Now, in this particular picture, I don't do not have the T-molding on the, the edge of the control panel yet. But the one thing is, once I actually put that hinge on there and got my T-molding on there, it's very nice because I can raise up that control panel and I can get to all of these controls. Now, I did have to end up mounting a kind of a support bar across here. Even though the control panel is resting on the side of the cabinets, there was a little bit of bounce in the middle so i just put that in there for a little bit of extra support but the nice thing about tilting up the control panel as you can barely see it here i also have access to the raspberry pi and here is that raspberry pi again seen from the front control panel when it's lifted up and the nice thing about having it right there is i do have access to the micro sd card should i need to to pull that out or replace it for any reason i can get to that just from that front control panel without the need to pull the cabinet out and access it through the back door so that's pretty much completes the control panel. Again, we'll get into a lot more about how the control panel actually works when we start talking about RetroPie and RGB Commander in the sixth part of this series. But for now, let's take a look at the rest of the wiring inside of the cabinet. Okay, looking in the back side of the cabinet, this is the top half, and this is that uh, mid shelf, if you remember from the construction, kind of the mid shelf support. And the top half of the wiring primarily focuses on, again, the controls and the audio visual part of the cabinet. 
In the background is the control panel. In this case, the control panel is actually shut, and there's that Raspberry Pi mounted there that we just saw. Again, this is the bottom of our display, or our BINQ monitor, our AC power, our HDMI connection, which comes right out of the Raspberry Pi into, into the display. This is that audio out. And so our audio out from our display actually feeds into the audio amplifier. And again, you can see the speaker wires are going to run right up to the speakers, which are mounted right above the display itself. Over here is that push button on the front administrative control panel to power up or power down the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you shut down the system through the, the RetroPie software, it will power the Pi down uh, on its own. But I like to have that button there in case I need to power down or restart the Raspberry Pi without powering down the entire cabinet. Uh, I did mention that two of the USB uh, ports on the Raspberry Pi are taken up by the control panel. That left two unused. So I simply took the two unused ports and ran up to that, that USB ports on that administrative control panel. They could be used to either charge your device or you could actually hook up a PlayStation or Xbox or a Nintendo uh, controller to that that could be used for games that would be better with a gamepad. Or you can technically have a third and fourth player using those gamepads in some games. And then finally, I just repurposed an old uh, PC fan that I stuck in here and it will support up to 12 volts, but I'm only running it at five just to keep the sound down. And it just moves a little bit of air over the Raspberry Pi. To be honest, there's so much empty space in this cabinet is probably not needed, but I put it there anyway. So this is the bottom half of the cabinet and it's primarily about power and power distribution. Now, right off the get go, you'll notice that there are two power strips here. The reason why there are two is I wanted one power strip that was going to be continuous power. In other words, it would always be on as long as the cabinet was plugged into the wall. And I thought I might need that because of the display or the monitor. I wasn't 100% sure at the time whether if I actually killed the AC power to the monitor and then the AC power was turned back on, whether the monitor would automatically come on or you'd actually have to hit a power button or use a remote. Well, hitting the power button was going to be extremely inconvenient and a remote probably wouldn't work because the IR receiver would probably be covered by the bezel. But the idea was to have a constant power supply for anything that needed to have continuous power inside the cabinet. Turns out I didn't need anything. Everything actually runs off this switched power strip. And so the idea here was to have a second power strip that would actually have an external button or a toggle on the cabinet that when I killed it would actually kill the power to this switch and kill anything hooked up to it. And that was relatively easy to do. All I had to do was take the power cord, splice into it, ran it up to a 120 volt uh, compatible toggle switch that was mounted again on the outside of the cabinet. You can see that here. So what actually happens is when I toggle that switch, it kills this entire power strip. And at this point, everything is hooked into that power strip. So therefore it kills everything in the cabinet and there should be no idle power draw other than whatever this power strip might be drawing for its little LED indicator. So that's our 110 volt AC power. It pretty much drives the monitor and the marquee lighting and these two DC power supplies. Everything else in the cabinet runs off of either 5 volt or 12 volt DC. So I opted to add two power supplies in here. It's actually a 12 volt 30 amp and a 5 volt 20 amp, which is way overkill for what I needed in this cabinet. I have plenty of power available. Turns out that most of these devices came with their own little power brick that I really didn't need these for much of anything. So even for example, the little light on the coin door. Uh, it actually had its own little power brick. I think it was a 12 volt. So if I needed space, I could actually eliminate the power bricks and I could run into my 12 volt or my 5 volt power strips. Even the Raspberry Pi, which is 5 volt, again, I could have run off of this instead of its own power brick. But I had spaces over here, so in most cases I used the power bricks. Really, the only thing that these are driving, uh, I believe the 12 volt is driving the LED light on that Pi power button and I am driving a couple of cooling fans, and you'll see the second one sitting down here, again, kind of blowing across the power supplies, but I can't imagine these power supplies get very warm at all because there's really uh, not supplying any amps or power to much of anything at all. Oh, I guess I am actually running the Ultimark, uh, that IPAC controller board with five volts. It is running off my five volt bus, but I have plenty of power to spare in here. If I decided I want to come back at some point in time, add LED lighting to the cabinet. 
I've got the availability, availability to run 12 volt or 5 volt. I have plenty of, of AC power here. If anything else would come along that I would want to add to later. And now that I know what I know about WLED, if I wanted to come back and, and add uh, LED strips, I could actually use the sound reactive version and actually have uh, kind of effect lighting on the cabinet synchronized to the sound of the games. But that's not there now. That would always be something that I could consider doing later. Here's one final look at the inside wiring of the cabinet. I probably could have did a little bit better job on my cable management, but again, close the back door and no one sees it. I do think it's important to make sure you label everything because you're going to forget over time. Again, I built this uh, four years ago. If I have to get back in there now, I'm really glad I have those labels. And I'll throw my normal disclaimer out there. Anytime you're dealing with power sources, make sure you use caution. Make sure you understand what you're doing. So that's going to do it for part five. It might seem a little bit overwhelming with all those wiring runs and all that wire, but it's really not difficult. You don't need to be an electrical engineer. I've said this numerous times. I think people hesitate thinking it's too big of a project. If I can do this, you can do it. Uh, there are instructions that come with all of the controls that make it pretty straightforward, and there's always a large community out there to help answer any questions that you might have along the way. But at this point, the cabinet build is complete. Everything is done. The last part we've got to do is what I'm going to cover in part six, the final part of this series, and that's going to be the setup of RetroPie and RGB Commander, which is used to control all of the LED lights on all of our controls. So stay tuned for that coming up soon. And as I always end most of my videos saying if you found anything helpful or anything you liked about that video, do me a favor and click that like button down there. That lets me and YouTube know you like this video. And Hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see some of my other videos and ding that little bell icon if you want to be notified when I release the next part of this series. As always, I would like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.